Welcome to SCOTUScast, a project of the Federalist Society for Law and Public Policy Studies. Our contributors join us from around the country to bring you expert commentary on U.S. Supreme Court cases as they are argued and decisions are issued. The Federalist Society takes no position on particular legal or public policy issues. All expressions of opinion are those of the speaker. Thank you for joining us for this post-argument episode of SCOTUScast. I'm your host, Spencer Karen. On December 2, 2020, the Supreme Court heard oral argument in Edwards v. Vinoy. The question before the court was whether the Supreme Court's decision in Ramos v. Louisiana applies retroactively to cases on federal collateral review. William S. McClintock is an associate at King & Spaulding, LLP. He joins us today to discuss this case's oral argument. And at issue in Edwards is whether the court's April 2020 decision in Ramos versus Louisiana applies retroactively to cases that are already final um, and are now on collateral review. Now, as uh, many of you may recall, Ramos held that the Sixth Amendment guarantees a right to a unanimous jury in both state and federal criminal courts. At the time that the Ramos decision was handed down, the states of Oregon and Louisiana continued to permit criminal convictions by a non-unanimous jury verdict. Um, my colleague from King and Spaulding, John Richter, led the teleform discussion when the court announced the Ramos decision in April. However, given how closely tied the Edwards versus Benoit oral arguments were to the substance of the Ramos decision, I think it's best uh, before diving into the Benoit oral argument to give a quick recap of the Ramos decision and its progeny. And so even before discussing uh, Ramos, I think it helps to go back even further to 1972. Um, and in 1972, the Supreme Court issued a decision in Apodaca versus Oregon, and um, that decision had the sort of practical import that uh, the Sixth Amendment guarantees a right to the Sixth Amendment guaranteed a right to a unanimous jury uh, in federal court, but that defendants in uh, state trials did not have such a right. Now, the, the 1972 Apodaca decision was a badly fractured series of opinions from that court, and um, it was a 4-1-4 decision. There were four justices who uh, asserted that the Sixth Amendment required a unanimous jury in criminal cases in both federal and state courts. Uh, and there were four justices holding that the Sixth Amendment did not require unanimity in either federal or state court. And uh, only one justice, Justice Lewis Powell, wrote a single concurrence holding that the unanimity requirement applied to federal juries but was not incorporated against the states. And since Justice Powell provided the most narrow rationale supporting the judgment, in Apodaca, his uh, concurring opinion was controlling. And so for 48 years after the Apodaca decision, Oregon and Louisiana continued to have non-unanimous jury requirements in state criminal court. So in Ramos, uh, in, over the 2019-2020 term, the court was forced to grapple with uh, the meaning of Apodaca and whether the Sixth Amendment, in fact, required unanimous juries uh, in state court. And so by a vote of six to three in April of 2020, the Supreme Court reversed course and held that the Sixth Amendment does, in fact, establish a right to a unanimous jury that applies in both federal and state courts. Uh, the Ramos opinions, however, are were somewhat fractured on exactly what the court was doing with Apodaca. They, they were not nearly as fractured as the 414 um, 
decision in Apodaca, but the Ramos decision did leave some ambiguity as to exactly what the court was deciding. So six justices, Justice Gorsuch, uh, the late Justice Ginsburg, Justice Breyer, Justice Sotomayor, Justice Kavanaugh, and Justice Thomas all agreed that the Sixth Amendment requires unanimity in federal and state criminal jury trials. Three justices, uh, Justice Alito, Chief Justice Roberts, and Justice Kagan, uh, dissented from that decision largely on stare decisis grounds and pointing to Oregon and Louisiana's reliance interests. And so that's relatively straightforward. But interestingly, in, in ways that are relevant for the Edwards versus Vannoy retroactivity uh, decision, the court fractured on whether Ramos whether the court in Ramos was in fact overruling a governing precedent in Apodaca versus Oregon. So Gors Justice Gorsuch, Justice Ginsburg, and Justice Breyer joined uh, in an opinion indicating that, they, that there was a long history of viewing unanimity as part of the Sixth Amendment right to an impartial jury and wrote that the court's fractured uh, 414 decision in 1972 on Apodaca really didn't provide a governing precedent to rely on and almost um, treated it more of an, of an aberration that was being corrected rather than a governing precedent that was being overruled. And the court explicitly said that the court, or the, that opinion stated that the court does not need to overrule Apodaca um, and then said even if it was uh, established precedent, it was wrongly decided. Uh, Sotomayor and Kavanaugh, who joined partly in the majority opinion by Justice Gorsuch, did not join in that section of the opinion. And in separate concurrences, they both wrote much more explicitly that they thought that the 1972 decision in Apodaca, even if fractured, was governing precedent that the court was formally overruling. And then, um, and so relevant for yesterday, or I'm sorry, for Wednesday's argument, you had three justices who, um, two of whom are still on the court, uh, Justice Breyer and Justice Gorsuch, who were explicitly stating that they thought that Apodaca did not provide a controlling precedent that was being overruled. And then at least five of uh, the dissenters, Justice Sotomayor and Justice Kavanaugh, who thought that uh, whether it was right or wrong, Apodaca was a controlling precedent that was overruled by uh, Ramos. Um, interestingly, in the Ramos opinions, both the majority and in some of the current concurrences, several justices um, issued smoke signals or, or gave an indication as to how they would rule on the very issue raised in this week's uh, case of Edwards versus Benoy, and therefore sort of opined on retroactivity in the Ramos decision. So Justice Gorsuch, in his opinion, noted uh, back in April that the test that the Supreme Court applies to determine whether a new rule of criminal procedure applies retroactive, retroactively is sufficiently stringent that no rule has ever met it. And so he was referring to the court's opinion in, in 1989 in Teague versus Lane. And Justice Kavanaugh, in his concurrence, also cited T versus Lane, which held that a procedural rule does not apply retroactively on collateral review unless that procedural rule is, quote unquote, a watershed rule of criminal procedure that implicates the fundamental fairness and accuracy of the criminal proceeding. So interestingly, in Ramos, in April, you had at least two justices, Justice Gorsuch and Justice Kavanaugh, uh, stating that they did not think that uh, the Ramos decision and the un unanimity requirement in state courts would apply um, retroactively for uh, defendants on collateral review. So that brings us to Edwards versus Benoit, which was argued this week. Now, procedurally and factually, the petitioner is Cedric Edwards, a Louisiana man who is serving a life sentence for his role in a series of robberies and a rape in 2006. Of note, uh, Mr. Edwards is African-American, and at trial, the state used uh, a series of challenges to exclude all but one uh, black juror from his jury. 
and at least one juror, the lone African-American juror on the jury, voted to acquit on all counts in Mr. Edwards' trial. So none of Mr. Edwards' uh, verdicts in 2006 were unanimous, and the lone African-American juror had voted to acquit him on all of those counts. Uh, arguing for the petitioner uh, at the Supreme Court on Wednesday was Louisiana-based criminal defense lawyer, Mr. Andre Belanger. Arguing for the respondent was the Solicitor General for the state of Louisiana, Elizabeth Murrell. And then the court also heard argument from uh, Christopher Michel in the United States Solicitor General's office, uh, who appeared on behalf of the United States as an amicus in, in support of the respondent, uh, the state of the Louisiana. So to give you a quick recap of the arguments, arguing for Mr. Edwards, Mr. Belanger, attempted to account for the wrinkle I described earlier. He, was, he attempted to account for the fact that the court was divided amongst itself on whether Ramos had in fact overruled Abu Dhaka. Um, and in effect, whether or not the Ramos rule was a new rule or an existing rule, and Abu Dhaka was merely an aberration that had been corrected. So uh, Edwards argued that the justices, to the justices that there are two paths to holding that Ramos applied retroact retroactively. The first would be based on Justice Gorsuch's uh, opinion in Ramos that, um, that Abu Dhaka was not controlling precedent that the right to a unanimous jury um, was a pre-existing uh, rule of criminal procedure, that the court's uh, 1972 decision in Abu Dhaka was not controlling and did not carry any precedential uh, weight. And therefore, Edward, or Belanger argued that the decision in Ramos was not a new rule for purposes of Teague versus Lane. Um, and the second option, he argued, was to that even if you assume that Abu Dhaka was a governing precedent, uh, it was it was simply so wrong that it needed to be overruled, and that Ramos established the kind of watershed rule that would apply retroactively under Teague versus Lane. And so I mentioned it earlier, but but just to help uh, frame the discussion going forward, the decision in Teague in 1989 held that a, a new procedural rule of criminal procedure announced by the Supreme Court doesn't apply retroactively on collateral view unless the rule is, quote unquote, a watershed rule of criminal procedure that implicates the fundamental fairness and accuracy of the criminal proceeding. And so in effect, uh, because Justice Gorsuch had said, I don't even think that, uh, that I think that if Teague applies, it's probably too stringent um, to apply retroactively. I think Belanger was appealing to Justice Gorsuch and saying, hey, you don't even have to get Teague versus Lane to apply. Um, you've even said that you don't think Apodaca was controlling, so don't even get to Teague. It's just the Supreme Court reasserting um, the unanimity principle. Apodaca was an aberration, and therefore defendants on collateral review um, should be allowed to avail themselves of Ramos. Um, given that not many justices had sort of signed on to Justice Gorsuch's view, I think the, the weight of Belanger's argument is more that Apodaca was simply so wrong that this is, in fact, the kind of watershed rule um, that Teague was pointing to. And therefore, it, it, even though it's a new rule of criminal procedure, it should be applied retroactively. So that's the petitioner's argument in a nutshell. For the state of Louisiana, uh, Solicitor General Murrell argued that Apodaca was governing precedent, that the states of Oregon and Louisiana had relied upon it for, for 48 years, and thus Ramos was clearly announcing a new procedural rule, and that it therefore had to meet the Teague exception that it needed to be a watershed rule implicating the fundamental fairness and accuracy of the criminal proceeding. And according to Murrell, a supermajority non-unanimous requirement, so under Oregon and Louisiana, although unanimity was not required, um, there were supermajority requirements, uh, 10 votes. Um, and so the, the fact that there is a supermajority requirement rather than a unanimous requirement does not, it is not a rule that implicates the factual accuracy or fundamental fairness of the trial itself. And thus, Ramos did not announce a new watershed rule that would need to apply retroactively on collateral review. And then uh, Solicitor General Murrell also strongly emphasized the reliance interests of both Louisiana and Oregon, who was an amicus in the case, in relying on Apodaca for nearly 48 years to permit uh, non-unanimous juries uh, to return criminal verdicts. The, 
the Solicitor General's office appearing as amicus on behalf of Louisiana largely echoed the, the arguments of the state of Louisiana. Um, they argued that the Ramos should apply prospectively and on direct appeal, but under Teague versus Lane should not apply um, retroactively. The, the Solicitor General's office appeared to try to sidestep the stare decisis question about the controlling weight of, of Abu Dhaka and what Ramos had done, and simply argued that regardless of the precedential weight of Abu Dhaka, the, the lower courts throughout the United States who had applied Abu Dhaka for nearly 50 years were reasonable to rely on it, um, and particularly the state court in Louisiana was reasonable to rely on it when Edwards' convictions became uh, final. Uh, so, so the justices at the oral argument, um, uh, as with most oral arguments, did not sort of provide clear-cut signals as to how they were likely to vote in conference. But, but Justice Gorsuch um, was the only justice who seemed particularly sympathetic to the idea that Ramos uh, in overruling Abu Dhaka did not create a new rule. He stressed in his questions to the petitioner that the Supreme Court had long held that jury unanimity was a requirement, and um, uh, but he seemed to be the only justice that was strongly leaning towards agreeing with the petitioner's view that Abu Dhaka was not governing uh, precedent. Uh, it seemed that the other eight justices were much more focused on discussing whether Ramos created a watershed rule under Teague that would apply retroactively and and what the implications would be um, for whether th th it went to the fundamental fairness and accuracy of the uh, of the trial. Thank you for listening to this episode of SCOTUScast. SCOTUScast is a project of the Federalist Society, a not-for-profit educational organization of conservative and libertarian law students, law professors, and lawyers, founded upon the principles that the state exists to preserve freedom, that the separation of governmental powers is central to our Constitution, and that it is emphatically the province and duty of the judiciary to say what the law is, not what it should be. Don't forget to subscribe to our podcast series, including SCOTUScast and Practice Group Podcasts, on iTunes or Google Play. For an archive of past podcasts, as well as audio and video of past Federalist Society events, please visit our website at fedsoc.org slash multimedia. That's F-E-D-S-O-C dot org slash multimedia. This has been a FedSoc audio production. 